caught us. This is our land. The men died for the women and the women raised our children. Now's the time to resist. If none of us are brave enough, we're all gonna die. Stand up and resist. <laughs> <laughs>
the United States has unequivocally agreed that discovery gave an exclusive right to extinguish the Indian title of occupancy. This landmark ruling provided legal cover for governmental policies that would claim white Euro-Christian supremacy as justification for stealing indigenous lands and for the genocide of native peoples. In 1849, the California Gold Rush triggered the mass Western migration of settlers, putting them in direct conflict with existing indigenous nations. In 1851, anxious to protect white settlers on their way to California and to avoid a full-scale war with the Lakota and our allies, the United States requested the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Sioux and other northern Great Plains nations. Six Sioux men signed the treaty which recognized the Lakota nation's sovereignty over a vast territory amounting to approximately 5% of the continental United States. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, the United States sent its war-hardened soldiers on a crusade to settle the West. Led by the growing dogma of manifest destiny, the U.S. claimed the God-given right to expand its borders from sea to shiny sea. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill them. In 1868, unable to defeat the warriors of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations fighting to protect our lands and people, for the first time in its history, the United States appealed for peace and drafted the Second Treaty of Fort Laramie. The treaty established the Great Sioux Reservation, including the Black Hills and unceded Indian Territory, to be set apart for the absolute and undisturbed use and occupation of the Indians, and that no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy any portion of the Indian Territory. Unable to defeat our free Lakota people with military might, the U.S. government increased the use of deceptive practices to subvert our matriarchal system and to create the appearance of agreement when our lands and rights were stolen. It is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromise can be made. Just three years later, in 1871, the U.S. government ceased to recognize Indian nations as sovereign and independent with the passage of the Indian Appropriation Act. This legislation legalized the theft of our treaty-protected lands and further threatened our way of life with our buffalo relatives. The civilization of the Indians is impossible while the buffalo remain upon the plains. The mass slaughter of our buffalo relatives, the Tatanko Ayate, lasted from 1871 until 1910. In just the first seven years, buffalo hunters decimated the great herds of buffalo nearly to extinction. The U.S. Army encouraged the slaughter by providing free ammunition and supplies. In 1873 alone, buffalo hunters massacred more than 1.5 million buffalo. As planned, our people became increasingly dependent on the U.S. government for even the most basic of human needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. In 1874, after illegally trespassing on Lakota territory, General George Custer publicly announced the discovery of gold in the Pahasapa, the Black Hills. As intended, the announcement unleashed a flood of miners and prospectors into the Great Sioux Reservation in violation of the 1868 Treaty. In 1875, the U.S. demanded we sell the entire Black Hills region. We refused. The U.S. declared this an act of war and launched a massive invasion of our lands to annihilate our people. Nothing short of their annihilation will get the Black Hills from them. On the 25th of June, 1876, in the Battle of the Greasy Grass, or Little Bighorn, the Sioux Nation, along with our Cheyenne and Arapaho relatives, won a great victory over General Custer and the elite 7th Cavalry. On that day, we defeated the might of the U.S. Army and took their flag. 
Seeking revenge for their defeat, the U.S. Army directed Colonel Ronald McKenzie to unleash total war. U.S. forces went from village to village, killing women, children, and ponies, and destroying teepees, clothing, blankets, and food supplies. The U.S. then launched a sell or starve policy and withheld rations to coerce our people to sell the Black Hills and to relinquish our sovereign rights. These inhuman atrocities forced the surrender of many Lakota people to the U.S. agencies by spring of 1877. Despite being on the brink of starvation, few of our people signed the agreement to cede the Black Hills. When the paper was signed by Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and others to give up the Black Hills, the majority of the Indians of the Teton Sioux tribe were not there, and they never consented to giving up the Black Hills, and never gave those chiefs permission or authority to sell or give up the Black Hills. Unable to obtain the required three-fourths consent, the U.S. seized the Black Hills with an act of Congress, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Incensed by the illegal seizure, negotiator for the U.S., Henry Benjamin Whipple wrote, I know of no other instance in history where a great nation has so shamefully violated its oath. Our country must forever bear the disgrace and suffer the retribution of its wrongdoings. Our children's children will tell the sad story in hushed tones and wonder how their fathers dared so to trample on justice and trifle with God. After breaking treaties, seizing native lands, and destroying our system of life, the U.S. government introduced another element of the genocide of Turtle Island's indigenous people, assimilation. Kill the Indian, save the man. In the 1880s, the U.S. government joined forces with Christian and Catholic missionaries to steal native children, as young as two years old, from their families ship them to schools far away, burn their clothes, and cut their hair, deprive them of loving family contact for years, and use mental and physical abuse to force their assimilation into American society and the Christian religion. There are but two goals for the Indians, civilization or annihilation. In 1883, the U.S. created the Code of Indian Offenses to criminalize our culture and spiritual practices such as the sun dance, the giveaway, gifts for the bride, feasts, and medicine men. Punishments included fines, hard labor, imprisonment, and withheld rations. In 1885, the U.S. Congress continued its assault on tribal sovereignty by passing the Major Crimes Act which unilaterally extended U.S. jurisdiction over major crimes into sovereign Lakota territory. In 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation into individual parcels of privately owned property assigned to tribal members. Our people had no concept of individual ownership of our Mother Earth. The Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say I instead of we, and this is mine instead of this is ours. Two years later in 1889, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, the U.S. Congress passed an act to divide the Great Sioux Reservation into five separate and smaller reservations, including the Pine Ridge Reservation. The U.S. government opened the remaining 11 million acres of Sioux Treaty territory for public purchase, including sacred sites and burial grounds our people used for thousands of years. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. By 1890, our Lakota people, once powerful and free, were entirely dependent on the U.S. government. The U.S. had forcibly removed our people from our homeland, confined them to reservations, cut their rations by half, stolen our children, and decimated the great herds of our buffalo relatives. On the 29th of December, 500 soldiers of the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment surrounded Bigfoot's band of about 350 Lakota people at Wounded Knee Creek, 
and along with four rapid-fire Gatling guns, massacred 312 of our men, women, and children. Our people know Wounded Knee as a massacre. The U.S. government calls it a battle. 23 U.S. troops were awarded the Medal of Honor. Something else died here in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dreams died here. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. In 1903, the U.S. Supreme Court decision Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock secured U.S. hedge money over indigenous peoples by granting Congress unlimited authority to break Indian treaties unilaterally, to sell treaty-protected land, and to regulate all aspects of Indian affairs without the consent of indigenous nations. In 1934, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA. In a misguided attempt to fix the indigenous nations the U.S. deliberately had broken. Despite opposition from traditional elders and in violation of the 1868 treaty, John Collier, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and Harold Ix, Secretary of Interior, illegally approved the IRA Oglala Sioux Tribal Council and Constitution for the Pine Ridge Reservation with the support of only 1,348 tribal members out of an estimated 12,000 Oglala Lakota people. Most of our people were ineligible, unable, or unwilling to cast a vote. In the 1960s and 70s, U.S. Indian Health Services, IHS, physicians performed involuntary sterilizations on thousands of Lakota women aged 15 to 44. IHS facilities singled out full-blood Lakota women for sterilization procedures. On the 27th of February, 1973, 300 American Indian movement activists from more than 75 tribes began occupying Wounded Knee, the site of the massacre 83 years earlier. Traditional elders from Pine Ridge sought to exercise our people's natural right to sovereignty and to take a stand against the corruption of the illegal Oglala Sioux tribe government. Continuing the 150-year war on the Lakota people, federal authorities escalated the occupation of Wounded Knee into armed conflict with a force of U.S. Marshals, FBI agents, National Guard personnel, armored personnel carriers mounted with machine guns, snipers and helicopters, semi and fully automatic assault rifles, grenade launchers, tear gas, jets for aerial photographs, and paramilitary personnel. The occupation ended after 71 days when a local Lakota man was killed by a federal sniper and both sides agreed to disarm. From 1973 to 1976, in the aftermath of the Wounded Knee takeover, the U.S. government backed Oglala Sioux Tribe President Dick Wilson and his guardians of our Oglala Nation paramilitary vigilante force, nicknamed Goons, inflicted the reign of terror on Pine Ridge. More than 60 grassroots activists, traditional full-blood Lakota people, and our supporters were assassinated. 300 were harassed and beaten, 562 were arrested, of which only 15 were convicted of crimes. During that time, the murder rate on the Pine Ridge Reservation soared to 170 per 100,000, the highest in the world at that time. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the 1877 seizure of the Black Hills was illegal, but did not return the land to our people offering money instead. To this day, we refuse to accept the monetary compensation offered for the theft of sacred Bahasapa. In 2000, 
at a ceremony acknowledging the 175th anniversary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Assistant Secretary of the BIA, Kevin Gover, admitted. From the very beginning, the Office of Indian Affairs was an instrument by which the United States enforced its ambition against the Indian nations and the Indian people who stood in its path. It must be acknowledged that the deliberate spread of disease, the decimation of the mighty bison herds, the use of the poison alcohol to destroy mind and body, and the cowardly killing of women and children made for tragedy on a scale so ghastly that it cannot be dismissed as merely the inevitable consequence of the clash of competing ways of life. Though he described the multitude of ways the U.S. government has devastated indigenous peoples and nations, he failed to admit the truth. Genocidal warfare continues today.